Uh, let me actually start with just one slide uh, of thoughts. Uh, we have had some conversation around this, and you know, I keep saying uh, that I think as a scientific society, there are a number of things uh, that uh, uh, we are not thinking through. We, we invest a lot uh, in infrastructure, we spend a lot of money. It's been mentioned, sort of uh, fusion, CERN, uh, European Space Agency, and so on, billions of dollars. Uh, there is very little that is going uh, in software, and uh, scientific software and data, I think, uh, will dominate uh, science uh, in the 21st century. So I think as a scientific society, we are not thinking enough uh, about uh, what it means, uh, especially because uh, you know, most of what we do in software uh, is actually freely redistributed, so it's really open science, and also we don't really have uh, a model for careers uh, in, this, uh, in this field. So this is just some thoughts. Uh, uh, this is now goes into some of our own efforts uh, in trying to think and build uh, an infrastructure for software and data uh, that you know generally falls under the uh, agenda of uh, open science, uh, uh, very much based on open source codes, uh, like uh, many of you develop here, uh, with the idea that uh, on top of these open source codes, uh, it becomes important to have. Uh, an operating system to deal with all the challenges of computational science and a dissemination, a dissemination platform. So I'll start talking about, uh, let's say, what we call the operating system, that the Python infrastructure that we have been developing for many years uh, started in collaboration with Boris Kozinski, at the time was at Bosch, is now um, at Harvard, but it's actually an open source effort done in collaboration with an industry. And uh, the idea of this infrastructure was really try to answer what I saw as the four core challenges of pillars of computational science, uh, dealing uh, with automation, with the need uh, to do a lot of calculations, like we have discussed uh, this, this morning, having the appropriate database structure that allows data to be searched, allows data to be persisted uh, and guarantees full provenance. And a lot of this uh, should actually be taken away from uh, humans and users uh, that are error prones uh, and left uh, to the operating system. And as a human, we should work uh, in this green pillar of uh, uh, scientific uh, workflows. Uh, and if anything, as uh, uh, Claudia was mentioning before, you know, thinking how we can share our data, our calculations, uh, our tools. Uh, I won't go into the detail of uh, you know, AIDA as a Python infrastructure. There is a lot of documentation on the web, a virtual machine where you can play around. Maybe I could leave you with the image of how we store uh, the results of a workflow. So as a sort of green pillar, a scientist, we build the workflows for calculations. Those workflows automatically produce uh, uh, typically properties uh, from maybe a structure, from an input, uh, and then uh, all passages uh, in the calculations, uh, all the input output file, all the parameters uh, of the very many different codes that often you use uh, are stored in what is called a directed acyclic graph, uh, and basically every node is connected by arrows that allows us to traverse the graph uh, and uh, query the provenance. And uh, maybe this is how at this stage, uh, the, the, the situation with the uh, graphs is. But maybe I can give you a more uh, uh, live uh, demonstration of what would happen. This was uh, from uh, our first, actually, high throughput material discovery project. That was a project on exfoliation of 2D material, where we wanted to understand if given a certain inorganic material, it could be easily exfoliated uh, into a monolayer. And for that, you need to do a number of calculations. And here I'm just showing you a graph for one material, results of a workflow that does a number of operations. It takes from a database, a crystallographic file, it transforms it in the simplest possible primitive unit cell, it transforms that into an input for a quantum mechanical calculations uh, where a number of things are done. You calculate uh, what is the electronic structure, is it an insulator, is it a metal, is it magnetic, if it's magnetic, is it ferro, anti-ferro, uh, ferrimagnetic. Once you have figured out what the electronic structure is, you calculate uh, the phonons, and then uh, if there are unstable phonons, you create a supercell, you displace, uh, and then you relax. So at the end of this workflow, you get basically with your electronic, atomic, uh, and uh, a structure uh, fully, fully relaxed, uh, and you can do this uh, in a high throughput uh, mode uh, 
you know, with in this case a failure rate of around 5%. So given a structure uh, in 95%, uh, the workflow is able to deal uh, with any difficulty and converge uh, and converge uh, the calculations. This uh, can go into a, say, human readable form that you can use uh, as a supplementary material for your own database or you can uh, expose uh, to, to the public, uh, to the public uh, at large. Uh, some of you have seen uh, these presentations about AID. I think uh, that, that a lot of the work has gone in the last year in uh, rewriting uh, completely the workflow engine, but uh, in particular the daemon to really push this uh, pre scale and data scale effort uh, where nowadays uh, we can track uh, around uh, 100,000 processes per hour. So, so what we have is a single AIDA instance uh, can follow what is going on on a say heterogeneous set of remote uh, HPC resources uh, uh, for up to uh, 100,000 uh, processes. And so it's able to keep track of uh, every task uh, that, is, uh, that, is, uh, that is running uh, everywhere. So this was the first part uh, discussing about uh, an operating system for computational science. The second part I wanted to, to discuss uh, is uh, a dissemination platform, uh, that is uh, how we actually leverage uh, all this uh, to build uh, an infrastructure where we can uh, disseminate uh, things like tools, data, and user services, and you can actually go and log in here. Uh, I think that the people in my group like to make the analogy that if AIDA is uh, the engine, it's uh, more akin to Git, uh, and the materials cloud is more akin uh, to GitHub. And uh, the way we have built it uh, is uh, organized in five sections uh, that we call uh, learn, work, uh, discover, explore, and archive. And uh, very briefly, if you were to go into the learn section, all of this is not only open, but you can also ask uh, not to put uh, any cookies for tracking on anything. So you can just do it completely anonymously. So you can go into the learn section, and there are uh, a number of uh, tutorials and videos and lectures, and more and more is coming. And we have developed, if you want, you know, simple technology to record uh, everything and then to show it in sync uh, with uh, slides and you can use the slides uh, as an index. Uh, now if we go to the second part of the work that starts to get uh, uh, more interesting and it's actually one of my long-term goals that is you know the capability to offer to the community uh, user services. User services that could be inexpensive so we build uh, a set of tools uh, that go from you know, exposing standard crystallographic data, like uh, what are the paths for every space group, uh, to maybe machine learning tools, uh, how to calculate polarizability of chemical shifts uh, with uh, machine learning. But uh, more and more uh, what we want to give uh, the capability is uh, to perform a quantum mechanical simulation uh, with open source codes, uh, either in the cloud or uh, redeploying the entire infrastructure on your own machines. And so for this, uh, we have bought, uh, we, have, um, we have built a virtual machine that uh, redeploys everything uh, that we put uh, in this work section where you have uh, all the, say, open source quantum mechanical codes uh, ready, to be, ready to be used, but also the, the Jupyter environment, uh, this uh, actual environment uh, that we have uh, customized uh, to make it very simple to uh, perform quantum mechanical simulation using just uh, a, graphical, a graphical interface. And uh, if you have also an account uh, on the supercomputing centers where this entire infrastructure runs, you can also run your simulation on the supercomputing center, but the idea is that you want everything to be redeployable. And we have a, a registry where all the uh, plug-in developers for the different codes and different workflow that are AIDA compliant uh, put uh, their own material so everyone at a glance uh, can see uh, what is there and what is available. This is, I think, is an example coming from the EMPA laboratory in Zurich uh, where they do a lot of experimental work uh, on graphene nanoribbons and the computational group there has prepared for them uh, uh, an app uh, to do quantum mechanical calculation of, in this case, the band structure or the STM image of a graph in nanoribbon. And so their experimental colleagues uh, can go around and play and choose uh, exactly uh, what they need. 
Other sections that are present in the materials cloud are sections where we put curated data, we call it discover, or section where we put raw data, we call them explore. And if you were to go to the discover section of the materials cloud, you find different sections. This is coming from the one on two-dimensional materials, the project that I just shown. And again, because we have the entire provenance graph, it means that every piece of data or metadata can be tracked and say, here you look, there, is a, there are expressions like the band gap of the material, the binding energy. So whenever you see this piece of data, you can actually click on it and it brings you to the explore section. And you see in this case, just the first neighbors in the graph and everything can be explored or the entire AIDA database could be downloaded if you don't want to do things uh, graphically. And uh, the last section on the archive is something that I think resonates very well to this community, that is uh, we created for da data the exact equivalent uh, of, say, the archive preprint server, where uh, anyone can actually upload a set of data in different uh, curated form. I mean that the format is free. If one uploads an AIDA database, then it becomes immediately straightforward to push data to the explore section and let everyone also explore the AIDA database. But one can just upload the data. The data remain of your property. You get a DOI guaranteed for 10 years and so on and so forth. And so in that sense, I think we comply with all these requirements of data management plans actually in fairly extensive way because I think the entire reproducibility of calculation is guaranteed uh, thanks to this uh, entire set of uh, uh, um, directed acyclic graphs. Uh, this is actually the misspelled, uh, I just wrote technology, sometimes I learn new words that look cool and I should be more careful. So I, I, I wrote the technology stack that just means how this thing is implemented. This is actually how this thing is implemented as CSCS, that is the Swiss Supercomputing Center. But the idea is that on the left, say, is where the computational scientists work, an instance of AIDA built there, sort of you know, tune this with the um, say queuing system of the computing center to make sure that you don't flood the entire system when you start to really run tens or hundreds of thousands of calculation. Uh, and again, uh, one pushes uh, uh, the supercomputing centers to become not only uh, deliverers of uh, say computing cycles, but also more and more what is called infrastructure of a service providers, so providing also database solution and long-term storage. And this entire infrastructure then is also used to power those different sections of the materials cloud with sort of different technological solutions here. And in itself, the materials cloud is deployed through Ansible on OpenStack, and there are basically virtual machines for every section, and there is a duplicated development section and a production, a production section. Okay, with this, I think we could afford to do this uh, thanks to a Swiss effort that started in 2014 on design and discovery of novel materials, and uh, the 12-year timeline gave us uh, somehow the strength to try and to do something uh, a bit unusual. We work a lot with the Max Center of Excellence on Material Design, and in particular these days uh, with a number of European projects uh, that aim actually to deliver user services to the general public. And I think uh, with this I end. Thank you. Uh, let me actually mention, since we have spoken a lot about uh, uh, workflows and so on, actually at the same time that this workshop is going on, uh, there is one in uh, uh, Lausanne also sponsored by PsyK on uh, uh, writing a reproducible uh, uh, workflow. And if by any chance you're interested, the guys there do an excellent job of uh, uh, virtualizing everything. So you could go to aida.net uh, tutorials uh, and that points you to all the material of the tutorial. So you can download a virtual machine that is configured already with everything. And then there is an extensive set of documentation and tests and tutorial that you can follow basically as well as you if you were there. And actually, we had some of the talks uh, that were uh, 
as good as uh, if you were there and <laughs> Stefan gave a talk uh, in remote from here that naturally worked uh, extremely, extremely well. Okay, so and this is uh, this is where you find all the material. 